Welcome back. Again, my name is Becky Kern. I hope you enjoyed your small group time and your devotional time together this week. Today I'm excited to jump into the second and final introduction lesson for the book of Proverbs. For the last five years or so, our dear sister, Nancy Guthrie, has been recording a podcast which is aimed at helping us all learn how to better study and teach the Bible. It's a resource that I frequently recommend to people, and I also recommend it to you guys. But recently, she interviewed Mark Minnell, a pastor and author and well-known Bible teacher in the UK. Mark served for nine years at All Souls Church in London, England, which is famously the church that was pastored by theologian John Stott for around 30 years. Well, Manel tells a story about running into John Stott while out on a walk. And during the course of the conversation, John Stott asked Manel if he had a certain book in his library that he could potentially borrow. Stott went on to tell Manel that he was just doing a bit of thinking about the incarnation. The incarnation, to put it very simply, is the physical human presence of Christ. Christ, who was both truly God and truly human here on earth. Well, Manel, he has a heart for training pastors and leaders in the church globally, and he tells this story as a teaching point for us all. You see, when this interaction occurred, John Stott was already, well, he was retired from his ministry work. And he was in his 80s, and he had actually already written several books dealing with this exact topic. Books like The Cross of Christ, which many of you may have on your bookshelves. Well, as Manel says, Stott had been engaging with this, with the incarnation, most of his life. And here he was in his 80s, still engaging, refreshing his memory, learning, and diving deep into the teachings of the Bible. Manel, well, he told that story because he wants us to see, and I would say so does Solomon, that we are all called to be lifelong learners. Women who keep exploring and asking questions of the passages that we find in Scripture. And like John Stott and, and all the faithful men and women who came before him, we never outgrow our need for the Lord we never outgrow our need for the wisdom that is offered on the pages of his word. And we never outgrow our need for the grace that he offers us through his son. So with that in mind, if you'll read with me Proverbs 3, 1 through 12, as we continue to be lifelong learners together. Proverbs 3, 1 through 12. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace will be added to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and goodness and success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing for your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights." This is the word of the Lord, if you'll pray with me. Lord, help transform our hearts. Make us humble learners as we daily learn to trust, fear, and honor you. Now, last week, we began our introduction into Proverbs, our 101 class, by defining the terms Proverbs and wisdom. For a review, a proverb is a short saying that conveys advice or teaches a lesson and the second very important point we discussed is that a proverb is not a promise. The second term we looked at was wisdom, and we define that as a learned skill. More specifically, wisdom is skill in living well in God's world. Well, after spending a little bit of time this week in the book of Proverbs, you might have noticed that it kind of has a unique format. When most people think of the book of Proverbs, the short two-line sayings are usually what come to mind. And while there are plenty of those, the book of Proverbs, well, it can be divided into three sections. The first is chapter 1 through 9, where the wise sage 
the father, well, he poetically coaches his son on the dangers of foolishness and wickedness, while also presenting him with the treasure that is wisdom. In this prologue, he hopes to lay a firm foundation for his children by introducing us to wisdom and to her rival, folly. In the next section, uh, what most of us probably think of when we think of the book of Proverbs, chapters 10 through 30, it presents us with the short proverbial sayings and riddles, each, uh, each offering us advice as we learn to navigate all of life. These are seemingly random, but in reality, they are tied together to keep us engaged and thinking. Then there is the closing epilogue, the retelling of Proverbs through the acrostic poem of Proverbs 31. Well, our teaching format, well, it's gonna take a similar format. Our study begins by attempting to lay a good foundation in the first two weeks before taking on the majority of our lessons to look at a few topics that are covered in the book. Because I hope that together we can look to Proverbs to learn to how to more wisely navigate our relationships, our words, our work, and our wealth. So last week, we began this outline, but we really only started to lay the foundation for the biblical concept of wisdom. So today, we're gonna to look closely at those 12 verses from Proverbs 3 as our guide to help us to continue to define and understand wisdom. Well, chapter three, it opens with the father instructing his study, son to study, to remember, and to guard the lessons that he has given. Well, the implication here um, that the father is, well, he's afraid that his son will forget his wise teaching. And so he's trying to offer him a kind of anchor to hold on to. You see, in chapters one and two, the father warns the young son that there are those who despise the Lord's teaching both men and women who would rather seek personal gain and pleasure than follow the Lord's righteous wisdom. But the father wants his son to understand and believe that the most full and abundant life comes only in walking the path of justice, uprightness, and integrity. The teachings and the commands that he offers in this book well, they're not just simply arbitrary rules or moral teachings. What the Father is offering is an invitation into real flourishing. And we see in this chapter that the Father wants his son to experience health and abundant life. Who doesn't want that or, or want that for their children? So here, the father has chosen to give his statement of counsel, and then he follows it up by giving a motivating reason, a reason for us to choose wisdom. If the young son pays attention, and if we pay attention, we can see that following the father's teaching, well, it helps us. It helps us live full lives. Well, many of you know that I have been a cardiac nurse for nearly 15 years. And the majority of my career has been spent working at the bedside, um, kind of the setting, helping to take care of patients who have undergone major cardiac surgeries or procedures. Um, but I'll have to tell you, it's always been the oddest thing to me when in the process of discharging a patient and kind of going through the rules and regulations and, and kind of the medical advice, again, this is a patient who's just had a heart attack or worse. Well, when they look at me and very cynically or angry, and say, I don't really care what you have to say. I've had enough of the rules and I'm getting a Big Mac on my way home. <laughs> and I'll tell you, sadly, it happens much more frequently than you would think. Well, I've always found it odd. Well, because again, the dietary restrictions that we give to post-operative patients or to heart failure patients, the medical advice is for their own health and wellness. Their choice not to follow the rules, well, it in no way affects me. Uh, even if they are voicing their frustration and their anger at me, they're really only hurting themselves by ignoring the medical advice we're given. And worse, they are possibly missing out on the ability to live more full and healthy lives. But like them, when we deny or ignore 
the teachings and the commands of the Father, this is also foolishness because it leads to our own frustrations, exhaustions, lack of contentment, or even broken relationships. Now, I want to be really clear here. Ignoring the teachings and advice of Proverbs, they will not make the Lord love you any less. If you are in Christ, nothing can remove the Father's love for you. Nothing. But salvation, it's just the entry point. Yes, very, very important entry point, but our life, it doesn't end with salvation. That is when it just begins, which is what we see here in verses 1 and 2. It's Solomon, through his fatherly commands, well, he's giving us a glimpse into the heart of God and guiding us towards lives of peace. The word that is used here is shalom, And shalom in the Bible, it's not just calmness or a lack of conflict, but as one theologian describes, shalom is the joining together of God and humans and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. It's universal flourishing and wholeness. Shalom, in other ways, in other words, well, it's the way it ought to be. And this is what the Father what our Father wants for us. Daily flourishing, peace, and wholeness. Sounds pretty great, doesn't it? So how do we get there? (laughs) How do we experience this shalom and this peace? Well, thankfully, the next verses, well, they let us in on that. See, here in verses 3 to 4, the Father calls us to remember but not just to remember, to be transformed by the weight of the Lord's steadfast love and faithfulness in our lives. And here this phrase, steadfast love and faithfulness, it's the Hebrew word chesed. It's the term used throughout the Bible to specifically describe the unfailing love of God for his people. This is our anchor. Meditating on scripture spending time daily with the Lord. These things help transform and mature us because they remind us daily of the true reality of the Lord's steadfast love and faithfulness of his unfailing love for you and for me. Well, as we move on, we want to be uh, faithful Bible studiers. So we take a moment to observe uh, a very important point that the Father, he does not conclude with God's promises. He begins with them. You see, by reminding us of the Lord's covenanted promises, he lays the foundation of who God is, what he has already done, and what he has promised to do. All before giving us our next three instructions. You see, God always initiates, and we live and grow by his grace alone. So as we look to continue to fill in our definition of wisdom, let's look at the three important instructions that the Father gives us here in verses 5 through 10. Wisdom calls us to trust in the Lord, to fear the Lord, and thirdly, to honor the Lord. First, look at Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, which reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. All three of these instructions that we're going to review, well, they help remind us that the purpose of Proverbs, it's not self-reliance. I've said it before, it's not a checklist. The purpose is transformative faith, to understand the heart of God and have transformative faith. But I'll be honest with you guys. (laughs) I definitely want transformative faith. Don't get me wrong. But when I look at these three descriptions of wisdom, I see that they're not easy commands. They're all based in a posture of humility. And I don't know about y'all, but giving up control and power, it's really hard for me. And most of us... (laughs) well, probably all of us, 
We've had to do a lot of that in the last six months. So before we jump into the commands, let's look back to Proverbs chapter 2 and remind ourselves why the Lord is trustworthy. So if you'll look with me at Proverbs 2, 6 through the first part of chapter 12. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice and watching over the ways of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity in every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil. (laughs) Y'all, this is the Lord who wants the trust of our whole heart. This is him. Our good father who, who, yes, gives wisdom and understanding, but who is our guard and shield, the powerful arm of holiness and justice for those he loves. His steadfast love and faithfulness will never end. And this is who we get to trust and rest in every day, every day. But there in chapter 2, we also see the description of the straight and good path the Father wants us to walk. Did you see it? There in verses 7 through 9, the straight path is that of integrity, justice, righteousness, and equity, things that we have previously seen already in the book. I do think that this is a good place to point out another very important description of Proverbs. Living the good life in Proverbs is not, it is not what we today know as the prosperity gospel. The good life, the long days, the straight path have nothing to do with financial, family, or career successes. Are there wise and godly people who are wealthy wealthy and CEOs? Absolutely. But God loves and is faithful and is working in the hearts and lives of all of his children, from the wealthiest king to the poorest widow. Proverbs is not what we know as the prosperity gospel. So this then brings us to our second call of wisdom, to fear the Lord. Read with me again Proverbs 3, 7 through 8. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Last week, I pointed out that Proverbs, it's an insight into God's heart, that it reveals to us his love of holiness and helps us know how to reflect and align our heart to what God loves. The English banjo-loving band, say that five times fast, Mumford and Sons, well, they get it right when they sing, in these bodies we will live and in these bodies we will die, where you invest your love, you invest your life. See, from the beginning, God has instructed his people not just to love him, but to seek the good of others. And self-centeredness, what this passage calls being wise in our own eyes, well, it causes us to invest our love, therefore our life, in things that we think will benefit us. But in reality, y'all, they don't. What I mean by this is that most of us tend to have kind of a long list of things that we think that we have to do, things that we have to get done. Well, those things tend to take up priority over the real things that need to be done, the real life-giving, healing, and refreshing things, things like prayer, time with the Lord in his word, or honoring your spouse or your children by giving them your undivided attention, putting the phone down and actually listening, or slowing down enough to cultivate real trusting relationships. We all invest our thing, our lives, in the things that we love. So my question for you is, what do you love? Our third definition of wisdom given here in Proverbs 3 is found in verses 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats bursting with wine. 
Now we're going to discuss this point uh, much more in much more detail later as we have a whole week to unpack what wisdom has to say about um, have, or what Proverbs has to say about having wisdom in our wealth. But for now, um, let's look at the passage in its context and let's just say that the inner work of remembering the Lord's commands, of binding them to your heart and around your neck, trusting in the Lord with all of your heart, and fearing the Lord, well, those culminate here in an outward expression of worship, in the form of honoring the Lord with your wealth, wealth that he has already given us. The Lord has been gracious to us, and he is honored when we wisely use our wealth to seek the good of others through tithing and giving. Which then brings us to the closing section, section of the Father's lecture, here in verses 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary as of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. Now it's important to look at these two verses for what they are. They are not a full ex explanation of the theology of suffering. Don't put that weight upon these verses. But they're a recognition that the Lord loves his children, and there is wisdom to be found even in the midst of our pain. As one teacher wrote, looking at this, at this verse within the context of this lecture, he wrote that the lecture begins with the father teaching his son during the formative years and comes to a close with the, with the Lord's loving discipline during the rest of life. With the placement of this passage, one can assume that the son has not followed the father's advice. His trust uh, maybe was drawn elsewhere, or he began to fear man more than the Lord, or maybe he did not rightfully honor the Lord, and now he's dealing with the consequences of his attitudes or actions. <laughs> or maybe not. We don't always get to know what the Lord is doing or the plans that he has for our lives. But either way, we do get the assurance that he will be with us in the pain and the suffering, in the discipline. As past Pastor Russ Whitfield said, God had only one child free from sin, but God never had a child who was free from suffering. And this brings us to the invitation of Proverbs do we seek to be women of peace, of shalom? Do we seek to be women who trust and fear and honor the Lord in our words, in our work, at home, with our time, with our money? Proverbs is not the path to salvation. That is Christ alone. But in this book, we are offered guidance to see and reflect the heart of God. We are given directions on how to be agents of peace, how to partake in restoring justice and shalom, and in God's grace, guidance, to live full and flourishing lives in the world that he has created. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis has what I think is a very good summation of the choice that we are given in the book of Proverbs. Um, if you've got your study guide in front of you, it's actually um, printed there in the front of your study guide, and you can read along um, if you would like or just take a listen. But Lewis writes, People often think of Christianity, Christian morality as a kind of bargain in which God says, If you keep a lot of rules, I'll reward you, and if you don't, I'll do the other thing. I do not think that that is the best way of looking at it. I would much rather say that every time you make a choice, you are turning a central part of you, the part that chooses, into something a little different from what it was before, and taking your, whole, your life as a whole with all the innumerable choices. All your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature, either uh, either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with his fellow creatures and with itself, to the kind, or to be the kind of creature, to be that kind of creature is heaven, that it is joy and, pe joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to that one state or the other. If you'll pray with me in closing. 
Lord, help transform our hearts. Make us humble learners as we daily learn to trust, fear, and honor you. Amen. Again, I hope that you are enjoying your time in the depth of Proverbs as you study it each week and with your small groups. I hope it's a real blessing. Thank you for joining me, and I look forward to our time again together next week.